Welcome, everybody, to the Across the Sky podcast, Lee Enterprises National Weather Podcast. New episodes come out every Monday. Hope you all enjoy your 4th of July. It got a little dicey uh, there with the 4th of July hot dog eating contest. Of course, that was our last episode on Across the Sky. They were in a lightning delay for, I think, was the first time ever, but they uh, they came through. This week, uh, our episode here, a little bit different. We're not talking about hot dogs. We're talking about the water, and we're talking about ocean safety and making sure that you're enjoying, whether it's the bay, the ocean, and uh, making sure you're staying safe as well. Being that it is July and August, we're all taken off. We're all gone on vacation. So we have Randy Townsend. He is the Harvey Cedars, New Jersey lifeguard chief. Also uh, an internationally known surfer to talk all about that. But we have Kirsten, Kirsten Lang back on the podcast as well. She is joining us after a couple of months away on maternity leave. Kirsten, it's great to have you back. How's it going? How is the family? Well, thanks. You know, it's it's good to be back. It's good to get kind of back in the saddle and start working again and, you know, being here with the podcast. I'm, I'm happy. Uh, glad I missed it. Missed you guys and doing this every week. Um, and things are going good here in the house. I mean, it's a little chaotic. We just added our third kid to the mix. So that's, you know, it's a lot to juggle. Um, but overall, everything's going very, very good. We're pretty blessed here. Hey. Awesome stuff. You know, we uh, we certainly missed you when you were away, but we know you were, uh, you know, enjoying some time with the family as well. Um, with that being said, we're going to get right into our interview here with Randy Townsend on the other side. And I am pleased to have on Randy Townsend today to talk all about marine and ocean and wave safety. Randy is a friend of mine. Uh, he is based right here in New Jersey. He is the Beach Patrol Chief for the Harvey Cedars Beach Patrol. He's also been a competitive surfer going all across the planet, really. You can check out some of his videos on YouTube, and he is an ocean safety expert. Randy, great to talk to you here. We're talking to you right after the 4th of July. Um, how are you feeling now that we're really getting into peak, uh, you know, summertime people heading to the shore how are you feeling how are your crews feeling over in harvey cedars thanks for the wonderful introduction joe uh tickled to be here again with you on your podcast and another interview as well how i'm feeling and how our staff is feeling here today we're absolutely elated to be up there on the beach providing you know public safety to you know the public up there on a daily basis uh, conditions. Obviously, you would know the best since you are a meteorologist. Have, uh, in my eyes, at least just turned the corner here for us. Uh, a little bit late to the game. Water's finally warming up here today in the 70s up there on the beach. So we're absolutely elated to be up there, especially on such a beautiful day. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're going to have a big Jersey flair with this, but it has been, uh, it's been chilly until about the middle of June. And then we did turn the corner. And finally, the smoke is gone too. Yes. Randy, you know, just, just for people, because uh, we have people listening here all across the country, um, can okay. you tell us where Harvey Cedars is and how big of an area of beach you cover and how many people you have yep. on your beach patrol? Harvey Cedars uh, is a stretch of a beautiful seashore community down here on Long Beach Island. It's roughly 2.2 miles long from tip to tip. Uh, our bookends here in Harvey Cedars are awesome municipality of Long Beach Township on both ends. One is uh, North Beach, which is to our south, and to our north we have uh, the ever so famous Love Ladies. Um, and that's where we're at here on Long Beach Island, roughly six miles at sea from the Garden State Parkway too as well here in central New Jersey. Gotcha. And you've been with the Beach Patrol for uh, almost all of your life, Randy? Y yeah, 25 years. Uh, you know, it's it's been uh, quite some time. I haven't worked for any other agency, and I am elated to be here for another summer season, you know, occurring on an elevated level as the lifeguard chief for our 60 lifeguards that we have here on an annual basis, protecting the lives here at the Jersey Seashore. Uh, and Randy, you know, we wanted to talk with you uh, a little bit too about rip currents. They've been in the news a lot lately. Could you just kind of give us an overview on uh, what rip currents are and then, you know, why they're so dangerous to, um, you know, to swimmers? Yeah, so a rip current is a powerful channel of water rushing away from the shoreline. You know, it's usually caused by, you know, conflicting wind and, uh, you know, currents that we've had from either swells that are in the area for that day um, or that have 
pass through our region as well. They can also be caused by the tide, um, you know, large surf, so forth and so. And I read somewhere too, Randy, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but mm -hmm. you know, there ha again, there have been a lot of, um, there has been a lot of news about recurrence. Of course, there's been a lot of uh, people that have been either saved or that have unfortunately mm -hmm. passed from it. But, you know, to, to put it into perspective, um, you know, my husband is terrified of sharks. I mean, just downright terrified. But I read somewhere that there are twice as many deaths from rip currents than there are from shark bites each year. Do you know if that happens to be true or not? Uh, yes, I think, you know, statistically speaking, you can definitely say that there is a higher chance or probability that you would be swept away in a rip current than you would be you know, bitten by a shark or even, you know, fatal injured by a shark. Hey, Randy, Sean here down in, in Virginia. A lot of times I go to the North Carolina Outer Banks as well. Uh, spend some time at the Jersey Shore, love the Atlantic coast. I uh, was introduced to rip currents long, long ago, back in the 70s when I was a lad. Um, but for people who don't go very frequently, what's a good way they can spot a rip current before they go out in the water? Are there any kind of telltale signs yet yeah, um you know some telltale signs would be you know discolored water if you're looking at the ocean it'll appear to be you know blue or green you'll also see you know um, white water or sand mixed throughout the water and it will be rushing directly away from the shoreline and that discolored water can you know extend thousands of feet past where the actual waves are breaking on the sandbar and you know up to a mile or so too as well for the really strong rip currents that are out there on some of the most extreme days. How wide are the rip currents? Because oftentimes here you you swim perpendicular to the current to get out of it. But but how wide can some of these these currents be? It would have to, you know, depend on the behemothry, the other water contour of the, you know, sand and shelf that's there. Also, there's other variables that, you know, could come into play, rock jetties, piers, um, you know, storm drains, so forth and such. And that would depend on a, you know, case by case area on where you live, but they can be very wide. We've seen, you know, you know, two, three, four blocks wide in some instances where we have, uh, you know, gaps in the sandbar, so forth and such. And if there's deep holes next to, you know, piers or storm drains, those ones can tend to be wider and more extreme too, because the water pressure builds up against those, uh, you know, solid features that are permanent. So do they tend to be more more common near jetties? Yes, I would like to think that they would be more prevalent near, you know, fixed structures in the water, considering, you know, the tide and or swell direction is going to run one way or another up the beach, and it's just going to have increased pressure on those areas. You know, as you know, if you're piling water up in the corner of a tub, it's got to go somewhere else. So, yes, definitely more uh, prevalent in those areas, rock piles, jetties so forth and such. Randy, you know, you know, here on the East Coast, we got lifeguards that are usually patrolling up and down the coast here. You know, that's not always the case, depending on where you are, and especially on the time of year, right? Once we get to September, you know, even here in Jersey, you know, we're, we're really reducing the amount of beach patrol coverage we do have here. We've had 62 deaths, unfortunately, due to something in the surf zone. You know, when you think about the, the weather aspect of things, you know, for people who are, you know, they, they're going to the beach, there might not be a lifeguard around. They're living a part of the country where there's not. What kind of weather conditions, you know, are you looking for, you know, that's saying, hey, you know, th this is a day with a high risk of rip currents. You can apply this principle to any aspect of your life. The one most important here that we're talking about today is, you know, rip current and rip currents and, you know, creating awareness around those. Um, if you're unaware or you're uncertain of the conditions, if you don't have any experience, uh, you know, being at the shore, whether it may be the New Jersey shore or North Carolina or Florida, wherever you may be in the world, you know, if you're unsure, you always want to ask somebody. Uh, most municipalities, towns, and cities have social media outlets that have a plethora of information available on rip currents. Um, above and beyond that, you know, when in doubt, I would ask questions to somebody who would be close to me if there wasn't a lifeguard within the vicinity. But if it's, you know, obviously rough, there's definitely going to be uh, an elevated chance of rip currents in the area. You know, you can basically look at the surf. If there's waves coming in, you can almost guarantee that and on any given day that you're going to find rip currents prevalent at some point throughout that day. Best thing you can do is educate and inform yourself prior to 
heading to the shore destinations in the summer months or whether you may be visiting, you know, an area that has warm water in the winter, uh, you know, educate and inform yourself on rip currents and awareness because uh, with awareness, you have choice whether to go out or not or find a safe zone to So when I mean, you guys are going out, you know, in the morning, and you're setting up your stands and you have the flags, you know, and you have the red flags and the yellow flags. Are, are you actually picking spots that are the safest places at the sea or are you picking spots that might be just down the street that's an accessible point for people? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point of conversation here, Joe. Uh, you know, we have uh, morning muster every day where all of our lifeguards gather collectively and, you know, exchange information. Uh, a lot of this information comes down from our management staff to inform and educate our lifeguards, the employees, the individuals who are in charge of, you know, public safety on a daily basis to allow them to occur on an elevated level for the end user, the public. And anything we can do to inform and educate the public through our social media outlets or, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversation or by our signage on the back of our lifeguard stands to get the message out there for, you know, the conditions at hand that day. Uh, once we have this information, you know, collectively amongst our group first thing in the morning, uh, our management staff will work hand in hand with the lifeguards up there on the beach for proper, you know, flag placement, beach setup to ensure the safest area for swimming and recreational activities as well. So in short, we're not just, you know, tossing flags and, you know, the sand on some random spot on any given beach on any given day. There's a method to our madness, and uh, we're very meticulous about it to ensure, you know, the public safety. So I grew up going down to the Gulf Coast. I grew up in Texas, and so we were um, in that part of the country. Um, and I felt like the term undertow was used quite frequently. I, how are those similar, different? Are, do people get those confused a lot? Yes, uh, they, they, do get a, they do get them confused. Undertow would be considered or classified as you know, that down sucking motion that you would have from a wave passing by you. Um, but you also can be sucked underneath by a very strong rip current too, if there's any type of structure underneath you too as well. So that same type of sensation, although uh, undertow would be that, you know, when you're getting pulled under from a wave that as it's passed, because the water's actually going down towards the bottom of the ocean. And again, you know, during rip currents too if there's some type of underwater structure that would, you know, indicate that that type of current is there as well. Hey, Randy, um, is there a particular good or bad time uh, of day to be in the water uh, with regard to water safety? I mean, a lot of people want to go in early in the morning or, or late in the evening, I, you know, tides changing, coming in, coming out. Or, or is there any, any logic to that at all in terms of this time traditionally is good or, or bad? Yeah, I would like to start off by saying the best time you can, you know, enjoy the ocean, whether, whether it doesn't matter what beach that you're at, you know, uh, it's going to be between the hours of 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. when lifeguards are staffed, uh, typically on most beaches throughout the country. Um, often we do get water rest rescue calls after 5 p.m. and before 10 a.m. Um, you know, I would advise obviously not swimming prior to lifeguards being on duty and or after they've left for the day. Uh, you know, some beach patrol agencies offer extended hours till about 6 p.m., um, as well as some other agencies offer, you know, roving patrols up and down the beach like we do until about 8 p.m. every evening. Again, when in doubt, don't go out. And if you can, you know, swim with somebody who's a proficient swimmer, know your limits. Um, you know, definitely don't want to be out there by yourself with nobody on the beach. Awesome. All good stuff so far, Randy. We're going to take a brief break. And then the other side, we're going to have more about rip currents, the surf zone, and all good things here. Talking about the water with Randy Townsend, Chief of Lifeguards here in Harvey Seaters. You're listening to the Across the Sky Podcast. We are back with the Across the Sky podcast. New episodes drop wherever you get your podcasts. Every Monday, it's also on your favorite news website as well. We are part of Lee Enterprises. Over 70 newsrooms across the United States, including here in Atlantic City. We're on base. Randy Townsend, also in the press of Atlantic City coverage area. Chief of Lifeguards here in Harvey Cedars. Randy, let me ask you, you know, what got you interested in the water? 
Oh, my my uh, my dad and my mom. Uh, I had the uh, fortunate opportunity to grow up a stone's throw away from the bay and the beach, uh, in a town that resides, uh, you know, just slightly to the south of where I'm currently working here in Harvey Cedars. I was born and raised in Surf City, New Jersey, Long Beach Island. Uh, where I still reside today with my family. And for people, you know, who don't know, Long Beach Island, you know, hu- I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people during the summer. And then during the winter, you know, it's really only a couple thousand that are there. It's a much uh, quieter place during the winter, like many places along the uh, the Northeast Coast here, but a beautiful place to uh, just visit at. You have Barnegat Lighthouse on the northern tip of the island as well. Some some really good sites here. Randy, let me ask you this. Um, you know, you, you mentioned... Uh, just on the other side of this, I mean, in the first half about, you know, the best times to, to swim is when, you know, there are lifeguards present. A question I have for you is, you know, a lot of times you're seeing surfers out there at seven, eight in the morning before the lifeguards are present. You know, you're someone who serves and is a lifeguard. So how do you how do you balance out, you know, the fact that, you know, surfers want to get out there at certain times, but we're also trying to keep everybody who's in the water safe as well? That is, uh, you know, a double-edged sword that I do walk as a uh, lifeguard chief here, uh, but it's very, very obvious uh, the number of individuals who are enjoying the beach on a daily basis. It's general, the general public for that that matter. Uh, we do have surfing areas outside of our flags uh, where the safe swimming zone is. Um, you know, typically the sandbar where the safe swimming zone is, though, uh, is also where the great waves are because of the sandbar itself, too, as well. Um, but given, you know, the 2.2 miles of beach here, there's no doubt in my mind, since you can surf outside the flags on any beach here in Harvey Cedars, that, you know, there's more than an ample, you know, space for everybody to enjoy, you know, whether it's just swimming or bathing, uh, or if you're out there on a kayak, stand up paddle board or a surfboard, like I like to enjoy my free time as well. Yeah. And, and Randy is an illustrious surfer, um, has, has traveled all across the world surfing Randy. I don't know if you can give us an elevator pitch of your surfing experience, but if you could try to boil it down, just explain where you've been and, you know, some of the awards and accolades you had over the year, you know, you can check him out on YouTube. You can type in his name. You see a bunch of, uh, a bunch of videos there as well. But, but this man that we're speaking to is somewhat of a legend in the surfing community. <laughs> Thanks, Joe, for the awesome introduction to that other uh, aspect of my life that well, I enjoy true. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, I was recently inducted to the New Jersey Surfing Hall of Fame at the age of 44. Um, I work with a multitude of 501c3s, um, you know, to assist kids with special needs and learning f- through surf therapy. Uh, I also run uh, Northeast Conference of the National Scholastic Surfing Association, uh, which links, um, you know, schooling with surfing, uh, which is really, really gratifying. I am a high school surf team coach for the high school that I attended in my youth over there at Southern Regional, across the bridge in Manahawkin. Uh, won numerous pro surfing events here in the state and throughout the country and internationally, uh, internationally traveled to surf uh, extensively through Southeast Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, Central America. I mean, been around, definitely for sure. Um, my favorite favorite place to surf is uh, Southeast Asia, a uh, little chain of islands about 100 miles off the coast called the Mentalize in Indonesia. Some of the world's best surf there for sure. That sounds absolutely phenomenal, man. Uh, so I want you to riff on that a little bit more. But the other thing I wanted to to get for my own you know, edification, what are some of the bigger differences between the Atlantic beaches in terms of waves and, and sand and the like versus the Pacific Coast beaches, waves, sand and, and periods and wave heights and that kind of stuff? And then go on, man, and tell me about those beautiful beaches in Southeast Asia. I want to hear all about that. All right. All right. Uh, so differences between East Coast and West Coast, uh, I'll start off with the the most obvious. Uh, you know, typically up up and down the eastern shore here, except with the exception of uh, the Northeast and New England, we pretty much have, you know, sand covered beaches. There isn't much structure until you get up into like uh, Long Island, New York, out there on Montauk, Rhode Island, uh, you know, Maine and those uh, areas up there in New England. They have a lot more structure up there and 
do have similar characteristics to uh, the wave types that are out in California. Um, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, on the West Coast, there is a lot more structure of leading into the water. There's, a, you know, point breaks uh, where it actually has, you know, a rock or cobblestone um, shelf that leads into the water where the waves will actually, you know, peel in symmetry down the rock cobblestone reef or shelf out there. We typically don't get that in, you know, our waters here in New Jersey and south. We won't find that again until you get into the Caribbean and respectively up in the northeast, up in New England. Uh, above and beyond that, differences between the east coast and the west coast as far as it pertains to, uh, you know, swell forecasting and the actual surf. Uh, and Joe, you'd be able to comment on this one too as well, is that typically here, you know, when we get uh, storms, they're coming from land-based uh, here in New Jersey and throughout the East Coast as well. Uh, whereas out on the West Coast and in California, the storms that they get out there, you know, are coming from the ocean to the shoreline. So there's a huge difference in, you know, the actual quality of surf when it arrives and how quickly, you know, it dissipates as it leaves too as well. So on the West coast, uh, you know, when you get a storm system coming in, you'll have a gradual increase in surf with pristine surfing conditions until the actual storm makes landfall on the West coast. Whereas out here on the East coast, conversely, you would have, you know, the storm system typically being coming from the land going out into the ocean where you would have really rough conditions until the surf or storm passed where and then you would have uh, you know very clean pristine conditions for surfing as the storm departed here on the east coast um, and it would dissipate very very rapidly whereas on the west coast the swell decay would you know so to speak stick around for a lot longer uh, due to the fact that the storm has been generating waves out in the ocean for that much more of an extended period uh, you know, typically speaking, again, uh, you know, I've had extensive experience out there on the West Coast uh, with the, you know, Rocky Mountains being so so close in proximity to the shore there, uh, you know, and the fact that the water temperatures annually are much poor on a daily basis out there. They get a lot less wind than we typically do out here on the East Coast, um, you know, and respectively, the converse is also true here on the east coast as well uh due to you know the multitude of convection that we get all throughout the country here on the east coast we had typically have much windier days more powerful sea breezes uh and storms too as well when they are prevalent in the areas that we are enjoying i think you covered it all there randy i don't know if i even need to chime in on that one <laughs> you know i tried to make it uh clear and, and concise as possible uh, without getting into too much detail. I'm sure there's a plethora of other, you know, differences between East and West Coast surfing, but uh, a few of the most obvious I had mentioned there. A few minutes. Yes. You, you don't really get as many of those epic days on Surfline out on the East Coast as you might on the West Coast. No, definitely. They aren't as prevalent, but when we do get them, they are absolutely world class. Otherwise, I would have moved away from New Jersey a long time ago. So Randy, tell us, um, you know, if you've never been to the beach before, right? Or you, you're one of those, you know, one of those people that might go once a year, right? You're taking your trip down, you know, you're flying down to Florida, or you're coming to New Jersey, mm -hmm. or whatever. What advice would you give to make sure that you know you're enjoying the beach, um, you know, and staying safe too? If you're stepping on the sand for the first time in years. So if I'm coming down to the Jersey Shore for the first time and I haven't been here for a long time, I would, you know, immediately reach out to the municipality that I am going to be visiting. They would be the most up-to-date, you know, source of information that it would pertain to uh, the conditions at hand being up on the ocean front. I want to believe at this point in time with the, you know, technology that we have, everybody's moving forward at the same rate to be able to provide this information to the public on a daily basis. Uh, you know, above and beyond that, you know, NOAA is a great resource. 
uh, as well as a multitude of other weather media outlets out there that can provide you with, you know, current up-to-date information on how to have a safe beach day. Randy, anything else you want to add here before we wrap it on up? The most important thing you can do is just, you know, be, be aware of your surroundings and, you know, know your limits. And when you're unsure, you know, seek out the individual who may be able to provide you with the pertinent information that you're looking for and or point in the right direction to be able to acquire that information to ensure, you know, you have a safe beach day and you return to your residence at the end of the day. And if anybody wants to follow you, uh, follow, see what's going on with Harvey Cedars Beach Patrol, where can they do that? Yeah, social media at Harvey Cedars Beach Patrol, um, as well as, um, you know, on Facebook too. We're, We're there as well. Um, Harvey Cedars Police Department does a great job of, uh, you know, following up with our tweets and posts and social media posts that we have out there to inform and educate the public to make them aware of the current conditions here tonight. One more quick thing uh, before we go. What uh, what's lightning protocol, you know, thunderstorm protocol there at the beaches, uh, Randy? Yeah. So if uh, lightning is within proximity of us, we, you know, clear our beaches and don't return to the beach for 30 minutes from the last lightning strike within proximity of, you know, where we're at. Awesome. Well, Randy, thanks again for hopping on and talking about this, my man. It was great to have you on. And uh, we hope you and everybody in Harvey Cedars has an awesome and safe rest of the summer. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Joe, for having me again. Looking beyond the atmosphere, here's Tony Rice with your Astronomy Outlook. Mars points the way to Regulus, the brightest star in Leo this week. Look west after sunset, you'll first see Venus, it's at its brightest this week. Up and to the left, look for a slightly orange point of light, that's Mars, some 211 million miles away. Now the white star that's about a finger's width below, that's Regulus, it's also known as Alpha Leo because it's the brightest star in that constellation. Regulus is the bottommost star in the backwards question mark that forms the front of Leo. These subsections of constellations, they're known as asterisms. Things like the Southern and Northern Crosses, as well as the Big and Little Dippers, they're all asterisms. Constellations, on the other hand, those are more official things. The modern list of 88 constellations was recognized by the International Astronomical Union, the professional organization of astronomers, back in 1922. A few years later, borders were drawn around each one of those constellations. And it's those borders that serve astronomers by defining neighborhoods in the sky that can be used to easily describe where new discoveries can be found. That's your Astronomy Outlook. Follow me at RTP Hokey for more spacey stuff like this. Randy, as always, a uh, good guy to speak to. Very knowledgeable uh, and articulate as well. Um, and really good uh, breakdown of Atlantic and Pacific uh, coach beaches and their their differences when it comes to the swell and the waves and surfing and the storms and all of that. Um, you know, I, I feel like, you know, if you're in lifeguarding or surfing, it's almost like, you know, you know, half weather already or halfway to being a meteorologist, um, you know, and vice versa. So it, it was nice to have Randy on and, you know, talk about what to look for, you know, for rip currents in the surf zone. Uh, Sean, what do you think? Yeah, it's great. I mean, you know, meteorology, oceanography, they're entwined from the get go. That's for sure. Uh, so it, it's always nice to have have those two kind of things uh, merged together when we do a podcast. But uh, yeah, I mean, I kind of intrinsically kind of thought that idea about uh, the Pacific waves versus the Atlantic waves. But it was good to hear from somebody who's lived it, who has seen it. And the other thing, I was really glad you brought this up, Kirsten, about about safety, right? We we hear so much about, oh, the sharks, blah, blah. but rip currents are way, way more of a threat than sharks are to, to people at the beach. And I think anytime we can kind of repeat that message, it's the rip currents, y'all, it ain't the sharks. Uh, I think that's a good idea. You know, and before we did this podcast, I, I went online to just kind of do a little bit of researching about rip currents too. And they, uh, Noah has a good, video out there in case you do plan on heading out and doing some swimming they have a good video you know sometimes i feel like people always say make sure that you swim parallel to the shore and i feel like sometimes in my head i'm like what like it's parallel perfect like you know you're trying to put it all together and really think about it but if you go um to noah's website or kind of google you know rip currents noah 
um, they have a nice little video that they made, uh, a little animation that shows exactly what to do in case you do get caught in one of those situations. So it's worth uh, it's worth giving it a look in case for some reason I happen to go swimming on one of the Gulf Coast or one of the um, you know Atlantic or Pacific coasts over the next couple of years. Now I feel prepared. Are you, are you saying you're not planning on making a visit to the Atlantic or Pacific coast, Kirsten? Maybe not to go swimming anytime soon, at least. <laughs> you know, it, it's so different depending on where, you know, where you are and what your experiences are with the beach or with the mountains or anything, you know, like, mm -hmm. like for me, like going to the mountains, like is just like a foreign concept. The little mountains in New Jersey don't count, but going to the beach is like, yeah, everybody does that, but it's vice versa, depending on where you are. Um, all right. So good episode with Randy here. Um, uh, Kirsten, uh, you're working on our next podcast guest coming up next Monday. Tell us a little bit about what we have going on. Yeah. So kind of playing off of this too, you know, we were talking about how, you know, weather impacts, of course, uh, ocean and then, and, and, uh, and surfing and, you know, it also impacts sports. And we've talked about that a bunch, uh, in the past too, I think. And, um, and so what we have going on, uh, we're going to be speaking with an OU student. She is, uh, uh, she's a really cool girl. You know, I, I'm really very inspired by her too. I think she's doing a lot already just at her young age. Um, but she is also um, an avid golfer and uh, went to OU on a golf scholarship initially too, and uh, has put the two together, her two loves, golf and weather. And so we're going to hopefully sit down and chat with her a little bit um, on, you know, how much the weather does impact the golf game. Awesome. Well, we're looking forward to that. Um, we have the Open Championship coming up, too, so good timing as well. Um, but we are going to wrap it up for this week's episode of the Across the Sky podcast. Remember, new episodes every Monday. Check it out wherever you get your podcast, and we'll be with you soon. On behalf of Sean Sublick, Kirsten Lang, and Matt Hollander, who cannot be with us this week, I'm Joe Martucci. We'll talk to you soon.